In this video, we're finally trying to get Purple Pete to start up. I need some more voltage on that one, but before we do that, we need to make her look a little pretty before she goes down the road. Also, we've got to prime the oil system, fuel system, install all sorts of lines and stuff. Hey guys, it's Monday, and it is Purple Pete's hopefully last day in our shop. Uh, we've got a few hours left of stuff to do on it. Got to swap out the alternator bracket because that is actually broken. It actually didn't even have the top arm on the alternator. He just had the lower bolt, which is... We got to paint it and do a bunch of various stuff like getting silicone off the peanut cover. Let's prime that oil. So here's where we had left off and this is first thing Monday morning. See, mostly it's together and the head is not painted yet, but we do need to get the blow by tube on. We've got the fuel system connected, but we need to prime it and we need to get the alternator and the AC compressor brackets back on, the power steering bracket back on, whole bunch of little stuff. Peanut cover, the peanut cover was just absolutely coated in silicone. This is actually after about 15 minutes of cleaning the silicone off already. It's just they totally coated that seal. No reason to do that, but just waste time when going back together. This is the exhaust side. A lot of people said, hey, Warren, why don't you paint the head? I do paint the head. I always paint the, the head. In fact, that's one thing I always look for when I'm working on an engine is whether the head was painted when it was installed. Now, if the head is painted or not, doesn't really mean that the work was better or worse, but if you take the time to paint the head, it probably means you took the time to do other little things correctly. So, and also, you don't want to pull the hood and have a rusty head, and the rest of the engine looks fine. So... You can see that's like second coat of paint there. What I'm doing here is we are pulling the air out of the fuel system. What I do is I just put a brake bleeder on the return line of the head because the head's the highest point in the fuel system. Very hard to get air out of that. That's why I prime it that way. Now the oil system, I usually use the air compressor oil supply line and then I use this all-star tank that I really like and it'll fit two gallons and you just pressurize it and you'll force clean engine oil into the engine under pressure before starting it up. I really like that tank. Link will be in the description. And you can see I've got the thermostat housing back on. We got our new alternator and AC compressor bracket, so he can actually have the alternator mounted now. Here's the old one. That broken part right there is where the arm for the upper alternator support bracket goes. Now, whenever I'm working on engines, when I see stuff like this, butt connectors and wire nuts. I always try to fix it the correct way. So you can see here what I've done is spent the extra 10-15 minutes and installed a Deutsch 2-pin connector. It's way better than the way they had it before. What we're doing here is using an airlift to vacuum fill the cooling system. It's really the best way to do it. it gets rid of air pockets. You can't overfill it this way. You can't spill any. And you can do other stuff while the cooling system fills. So here we are. I'd add a little trickle charger on it all morning, but I don't think it was enough. Now, company policy is they're supposed to honk the horn before starting. If you've seen some of my other videos, you know that, but this one, the horn does not work, so that's why you don't hear it honking. But what we did was we pulled the battery cover off and put the big jump cart starter on it to hopefully get it to fire up, see how long it takes. You might have heard a couple little pops there. Remember these injectors are out. They're the old injectors. They could have some air in them even though I vacuum primed them. But within about 10 seconds of running, they stopped popping. So that's somewhat normal. Um, they cleared up right away and stopped doing it. And the engine actually ran really good. He's The initial complaint why it was coming in was low fuel economy and the fluttering noise. He said all that was gone. Um, fuel economy, he'll have to let me know if that's been resolved. but. All in all, it started up fine, no problems. Really, the customer was happy with the work and no destruction ensued. This week's Destruction of the Weeks comes from Dominic. Thank you, Dominic. And he had a C12 that had a miss on number four cylinder and he found this. If you don't see what I'm looking at, there's actually the brass bushing for the roller there the injector roller had pushed out. Now what's weird is this one we're looking at is actually number six. Now, number four was the one missing, but number six looked way worse than number four. 
But guess what? It was running fine. Number six was running fine, at least. Number four was the one missing, and that one didn't even look that bad. Thanks for sending the picture. Hey guys, so Purple Pete has left, and all was running good for that guy, so hope he's happy with those repairs. What do we got next on the docket? Well, it's a fire truck with an international engine in it, and it looks like it has coolant coming out of the exhaust, so. This could be an interesting one. Now folks, I am not an international expert. And here's the problem we've got. We've got no coolant in the coolant reservoir. There is coolant, however, at least traces of it, coming out of the exhaust side of the turbocharger. This is not good. Now remember, Purple Pete had coolant coming out of the exhaust too, and that ended up being almost a full rebuild. Now this one is not locked up. I rotated it, it rotated fine. You can see this is, although it kind of looks like oil, it's actually coolant. If you get directly over it, it is red, but kind of what I wanted to show here is just the ridiculousness of international trucks. I mean, look at how much junk is on this engine. Like you can't even hardly get to anything. I mean, pulling the air cleaner was, was like four things connected to it. Not least of all, this stupid little line that's, you, you can't even see it. Not only that, when you try to remove it, what happens? The little nipple just snaps off when you're trying to pull the line off, even gently. So, that's fun. Now, what we're looking at here is the turbocharger has this, and I'm not sure what an international calls it. A cat would call it a pre-cooler, but it's a coolant-to-air heat exchanger. And that was the first thing I checked, because if that had a bunch of coolant in it, that'd be an easy fix. But, of course... It is dry as a bone. So that's not our problem here. I mean, these 800 lines in the way, that's a problem, but that's not causing the coolant to be in the exhaust system. So what I'm kind of trying to do here is figure out how do I separate, and I'm, this is an intake tube I was gonna pull off, but I noticed a problem right away when I was doing this. It's towards the back of the engine here, and I'm gonna show it to you folks. You may have missed this earlier, but here's a big problem with this. <laughs> Yeah, it's a uh, horrible design. So, gonna try and pull the doghouse. Now the doghouse on these does give you access to the back of the cylinder head, the back of the exhaust manifold, the back of the EGR cooler, which the EGR cooler is behind the turbos. There's the doghouse. However, it is pretty much impossible to get off without almost removing everything in the cab. You gotta pull the carpet back, which means you gotta pull all these panels. That's the doghouse. And that doghouse is pretty much larger it's the largest thing in the dash. So to get it out, it's gonna be fun. So I've pulled the fuse panel off, pulled the side trim pieces off. This is like the right side kick panel. Now notice it has this alarm button, siren. Yeah, no, there's, there's no connector for that. So that's hardware, that's really fun. So I gotta leave that connected there. Had to pull like the cover for the cabin air filter so you can pull the uh, carpet back. That's some of the stuff I had to pull to get that off. Now this the side trim piece here goes, the seatbelt goes through it, so can't pull that off easier. Now notice I did get the doghouse out, had to pull the carpet back on that, side kick panel, the shifter controller, and then work that doghouse out. Now the seat had to be removed, or at least unbolted and moved out of the way, which means this, which the seatbelt goes through. Also the battery disconnect had to be removed because it goes through the seat. There's about 800 positive battery cables on this. There's actually only like two threads holding those battery cables in. With the nuts, they were pretty, uh, let's just say they needed longer studs. Now this is your intake from the EGR to your intake, and that needs to be pulled off, and we need, if we're gonna try and pressurize this thing somehow to check the EGR cooler. However, you can't really get to the bottom bolts without pulling this, which is the exhaust brake, and also the downpipe for the turbo, which is almost as big as the hole for the doghouse. Also fun. It also has a fuel injector for the regen system I had to pull off, and coolant that goes to it, so I had to drain that. Now, that tube, the exhaust manifold to the rear of the EGR cooler, though, look at this, look at how big this thing is. That is ridiculous! Now, I know what it does, but trying to get it out of there, that was, that was like some industrial Tetris there. Now this thing, I don't know what the heck flux capacitor technology, why is that bent like that? You couldn't have gone a straight line? What, do you guys make, you have like a stainless steel bend 
factory too. You got to make more money off of that. So here's the rear of our AGR and our exhaust manifold. Uh, yeah, that's going to be interesting. So the it's wet coming out of the EGR, but that does not tell us whether the EGR or the exhaust manifold is where the coolant's coming from. Now, I had a bunch of hours into this already, and we were waiting authorization to either pull the exhaust manifold or the EGR cooler or try to figure out a way to test the EGR cooler while it's on there. So it ended up going into the weekend, which is basically this is our stopping point. Now, I don't know if you want to watch me war working on internationals. If you do, let me know in the comments section or if you just want me to get back on cats, which I'm much more comfortable with. But that's pretty much the end of this video. I want to say thanks for watching and thanks to John, Randy, and Gina for sending donations at adeptape at yahoo.com this week. I really enjoyed making the Purple Pete series, and if you want to see any of the tools I use in the videos, check out the link in the description below.